She was a hero of the Arab Spring, but is she now helping or hurting efforts to stop the war in her own country? I'll ask Yemen's Nobel Peace Prize winner, Tawakkul Karman. I'm Mehdi Hassan. Also on the show, are the United States and Iran on the path to becoming BFFs? Should these two proud nations use the recent nuclear deal to try and bury the hatchet? That's our debate featuring a former director of the CIA who's compared Iran to Nazi Germany. But first, in 2011, Yemeni activist Tawakkul Karman became the first Arab woman to be awarded a Nobel Prize and the second youngest Nobel Peace Prize winner ever. Earlier this year, she was forced to flee Yemen after the country's Houthi rebels attacked her home. And she's kept up her opposition to them. But is she equally critical of the Saudi-led bombing campaign of her country? Joining me in the studio, this week's headliner, Tawakkul Karman. Thanks for joining me on Upfront. Tawakkul, you said in your Nobel Peace Prize lecture in 2011 that you have, quote, always believed that resistance against repression and violence is possible without relying on similar repression and violence. Why then do you seem to be supporting the Saudi-led bombing campaign of your country, the poorest country in the Middle East, which has been going on now for more than five months? Uh, thank you, Mahdi, for inviting me to this very important program. Uh, um, I always against the militia. I'm always against the coup of Ali Saleh, uh, who uh, led a counter revolution against Yemeni revolution, the against president. the former president, exactly, against the values, against the the uh, outcomes of the national dialogue, against uh, all the uh, uh, gains of the uh, our peaceful revolution, and also our the our nation. We want to end the war in Yemen. We want to end the violence. And uh, it's, it must be, yeah, we have to make, to give solution for, the, for that. We have to rebuild the peace in our country. So we will not be able to build peace in Yemen, sustainable peace in Yemen, without uh, first, without drawing the all women from all militia and from in the front of uh, 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 militia of Al Houthi, uh, on the f uh, uh, with the, they have to draw uh, from all the cities. The, then they have to transfer to be a political party. Then we have to go to uh, a constitution to have referendum and then to make uh, election. So we need... Should there be a ceasefire now? Would you call for a ceasefire yeah. from Saudi Arabia and from the Houthis in order to get to your negotiated this, settlement? Yes, exactly. I call for ceasefire in parallel with this solution. So it's... it's uh, um, comprehensive solution. Okay. So ceasefire in prayer with withdraw uh, from all the cities, uh, hand over the, okay. the, the, the weapons, transform to political party because it's impos impossible to, that this uh, group uh, carry the, the, the weapons to have, you know, and use the violence okay. to have their, you know, uh, political, you know, uh, goals and also referendum for the constitution and dialogue. You've been very vocal against the militias, against yeah. the coup, yeah. against Saleh, but right now in Yemen, there's a blockade of ports, there's 13 million people uh, without access to food, there's 2,000 civilians have been killed. The United Nations says the Saudi-led coalition is responsible for that. And your voice is not vocal against that. We haven't heard you uh, criticize Saudi Arabia in the same way you criticize the Houthi rebels. Um, uh, maybe my uh, explanation or uh, I, I, I accuse the militia of Al Houthi and uh, Ali Saleh uh, himself and his alliance, the main reason of all this, you know, uh, conflict in Yemen because they are the one who, uh, who declare the war. Why can't you condemn both? Uh, I condemn them both. So you're opposed to the Saudi of bombing of Yemen. You would like the Saudi Arabian coalition I, to stop bombing Yemen. Yes I, or no? Uh, I told them they have to avoid the citizen from the conflict. What is happening That's with the Saudi? That's a different answer to what no, do you No. Do you support? Do you support the Saudi bombing campaign of Yemen? It's a very simple bombing? question. Yes no, or no? No one. Of course, no. So no, you don't want no any military one, action? Again, not just me. Even all Yemeni people now who are welcome the Arab coalition uh, uh, inside Yemen to 
to help them or to end the uh, uh, militia uh, uh, of the Houthi occupation and also the coup of Ali Saleh. Even they, uh, they are, they, we don't want war. We don't want Do violence. Do you believe the coalition has committed crime? You say the Houthis have committed crimes, and many human rights groups agree with you. But they also say Saudi Arabia has maybe committed war I crimes. Can't Do you agree yeah, with that? Yeah, I am against all the crimes that happening in Yemen against the civilians. Either it became from the Arab coalition led by Saudi or the militia uh, and Ali Saleh. What is happening now? Please listen to the voice of people in Yemen who they're ha yani, uh, uh, under the attack of the militia through the machine of uh, violence mm. uh, of the Houthi and, and, uh, and uh, Ali Saleh. You know, they destroy cities, they destroy Taiz, they destroy Adam, they equipi equipied uh, uh, our capital, they uh, uh, threatened our, our neighbors, they, uh, um, they put our president and our uh, government under uh, okay. uh, home arrest. So this is very yes. important. So this is very important. That all, these all crimes are documented on all sides. Yeah, and now we are, as Yemeni people, suffered from them as th the first, and from th from you know the you know the attack. When when the attack is uh, the Arab coalition is attacking the civilians, so we suffer from that. This is very important. But this Arab coalition, I mean, the problem is in public you're saying, okay, I'm willing to criticize them, but in private you've taken a different view. There were Saudi foreign ministry cables that were released by WikiLeaks in 2011, in which you told the Saudi ambassador to the UN how much you appreciated Saudi Arabia, you praised its leadership, and you said that the Sunni parties of Yemen were, quote, natural allies of the Saudi kingdom. Do you regret saying that? If you read the whole, you know, document, the whole WikiLeaks, they, that I commend them because why do they give Ali Saleh the immunity? And I told them in very clear voice that they alliance because Saudi at that time was, was has a, a big alliance with the uh, tribe in the north of north. Mm. I told them you are wrong that you have, you know, a coalition and alliance with the north of north. You have to be with all Yemeni people. You are our neighbor, so you, your future, your choice must be with Yemeni people. And, and because of that, they didn't listen to this advice. Maybe, now but, that is but, happening, but you're but also no. the advice was to ally with the Sunni parties in no, Yemen. No, no, that is, that is, that that's not what you no, said. That well, let me with ask, Yemeni, okay. with Yemeni Well, that's not people. what the document says, yeah. but let me ask you mm. this. A lot of people see the war in Yemen, both in the Middle East and here in the West. They see yes. the Yemen war as a Sunni versus Shia war, a sectarian war. Uh, You're a Sunni politician activist from Yemen. How do you see it? Do you see it as a Sunni Shia war? No, please don't say that I am Sunni. I am Muslim. That's it. So I don't belong to any sectarian you know, side. And that is what Yemeni people think. There is no Sunni and Shia. There is Yemeni people. And now the conflict in Yemen but when you when you tell Saudi Arabia we are your natural allies, when you say on Facebook there's a Persian occupation, that sounds quite sectarian from you. No, a lot of people, isn't. admirers of yours in the West, were surprised to hear you using this. No, language. it is, and here again, it's a Persian uh, um, uh, Cubans, and this is not my. The Houthis are Yemeni; they're not Persian. No, they are the tool of. Uh, Iran. They're not an indigenous Yemeni movement. No, again, it's the, they are the tool of Iran, and this is not something that uh, um, I give it uh, uh, from my from my uh, 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 own perspective. It is the statements of Iranian people. The, the, it is the statement of the uh, of. Uh, uh, Jawad Zarif. It's a, it's a statement of the. Uh, I don't think Jawad yeah. Zarif has said that the Houthis are our tools. In no, fact, no, the U.S. No, no, government, no, no. Again, the U.S. government says Mahdi. Iran does not exert command and control over the Houthis in Yemen. That's what the U.S. government. The, says. This is what they said before, but okay. now they are talking about okay. a big alliance between Iran and you know and. But Houthis. is it a sectarian alliance? That's what I'm asking. Is it a sectarian? I question? said that Iran play bad role and want to make the war inside Yemen and inside all Arab Peninsula between Sunni and Shia. You're one of the Middle East's most prominent campaigners uh, for women's rights. Uh, what role do you think women can play in the battle against extremism in the Middle East? <laughs> Woman is the key uh, for uh, solving most of the problems in her society if she decided to be upfront so she must do something and when woman decided to do something she did and that is what's happening in Arab Spring and that is what's happening in our peaceful revolution 
all women when they decided to lead the demonstrations to lead the change without taking any permission from men any permission from government any permission from uh, religious she be in the street and she led her uh, her you know her society to the to, uh, to the freedom because of that women in arab spring could step down muammar uh, al-qadhafi and mubarak and ali salih and inshallah very soon bashar al-assad what do you say to men in the Middle East who say women should need permission to come outside of their houses. They shouldn't be able to say drive cars in Saudi Arabia. They shouldn't be able to go to school in Afghanistan. What do you say to those uh, men in, in, in some of those Muslim majority societies who hold such views? I will tell them, shut up. <laughs> we need, uh, you, you should you know, know who you are. And you will not be able to, and all the problem to men like this, I will tell them that all the, mo the problems came from you. All the solution from, from, came from us. Tawakil Kalman, thanks for joining me on Upfront. Are the United States of America and the Islamic Republic of Iran destined to remain the best of enemies? Or does the recent nuclear deal, which just cleared a major hurdle in the US Senate, herald a new and more positive chapter in US-Iranian relations? I'm joined here in the arena by James Woolsey, former director of the CIA and chairman of the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies. He's compared Iran to Nazi Germany. I'm also joined by Trita Parsi, founder and current president of the National Iranian American Council, NIAC, and author of the book, A Single Roll of the Dice, Obama's Diplomacy with Iran. Thanks for joining me, gentlemen. Thank you for having us. James Woolsey, isn't it now past time, after all these years, all these decades, for the US to take Iran off its axis of evil, for Iran to stop calling US the great Satan. Isn't it time for the two sides to just bury the hatchet? The US has no problem with the Iranian people. Uh, they're a great people. They have a great history. Uh, they're talented. Uh, they'd be a marvelous uh, addition to the community uh, of nations. The Iranian government in these days and times is theocratic, totalitarian, genocidal, and imperialistic. And each of those words, I think, can be supported if they're not just a string of expletives. So as long as uh, the leader of Iran, as long as Khamenei himself chants death to America and death to Israel, then I think any reconciliation between the United States government and the government of Iran that wants to destroy us uh, is impossible. It's impossible, Trita Parsi. Well, the same people who said that it's impossible about this now were also the same people who said that it's impossible to negotiate with the Iranians. Said it's impossible for the Iranians to come to the table. It's impossible for the Iranians to uphold the JPOA, the interim agreement. On everything they said about Iran when it came to what it could or could not do, they ended up being wrong. President Obama managed to do this by not listening to those voices. At the same time, I think it's important to understand that there are significant limitations to how far the United States and Iran could move towards each other. I don't think they're going to be best friends anytime soon. But I think they can stop being worst enemies. How can they stop being worst enemies when, as James Woolsey says, Ayatollah Khamenei, the supreme leader of Iran, is, is endorsing the death to America message? Quite hard to be. Well, it's, I think it's important to understand that things are changing. Ambassador Woolsey mentioned the Iranian people and that they're great people. I would agree with him on that. And the Iranian people were 78 percent behind this deal. They wanted a negotiation with the United States. And the Iranian we people want no a better relationship. We have no problem in listening to the Iranian people. We don't think that the Iranian theocratic, totalitarian, genocidal, imperialistic government speaks for the Iranian Is that people. an accurate description of the government? Um, I think there's all the problems with this uh, government, without a doubt. But I don't think they're genocidal. And I think it's also kind of if bizarre to call them imperialistic they when death the, to Israel. Uh, what, well, what's non-genocidal about the that? The very uh, policies that you supported, Ambassador, are the imperialistic policies. The single most Nonsense. destabilizing event in the Middle East for the last 25 years was the invasion of Iraq. And it Nonsense. was an imperialist The most act. destabilizing set of events is Iran's leadership it of, is as of, a result of the of invasion of Iraq that we have this it's, tremendous, disastrous situation it's, it's, in the region it's right Iran's now. Everything from ISIS of the role of to everything that is happening right state. now number one terrorist state. If you would just shift from death to America and death to Israel to, say, indigestion for Israel or uh, sprained ankles for the United but States, then you could move from number one to number two in the terrorist sponsoring the, states. The, the issue with uh, 
the focus on the rhetoric is very fascinating. I personally think it is very wrong of the Iranians to chant those deaths. And incidentally, a lot of Iranians also agree with that. And in fact, today, they go and they wipe out the death to uh, America graffiti that had been put on the walls of the U.S. Embassy but in broad daylight. Let me just ask this question of you, just before we move on on the genocidal point, because you're saying it's genocidal, wants to wipe out the Jewish people, yes, is what uh, you're sure. saying. There are 10,000 Jews living in Iran, 60 synagogues, and a Jewish member of parliament. If you're a genocidal government, as Hitler was, right. why wouldn't you start at home? Why haven't they killed the 10,000 Jews living within their own borders? Maybe they want to focus on uh, Israel rather than on the 10,000 Jews. So it's not Jews a Jewish are, problem, it's an Israeli right, problem. Right. It's, uh, it's, it is a problem that the Iranian government has created. Okay, the number one terrorist threat the American government says, and many governments now say, is not al-Qaeda, it's ISIS. When you're fighting against ISIL, the Islamic State, ISIS, Daesh, whatever you want to call it, Iran is now leading that fight. And many say that America and Iran should be working together well, against the threat it, it, from ISIL. Well, the I'm government, guessing you don't agree. The, the government of Iran and uh, ISIS are a little bit like uh, the communists and the Nazis back in the late 30s and early 40s. Both are totalitarian. Iran is much more dangerous right now than ISIS uh, because Iran's closer to a nuclear weapon. I think Iran's very close to having a nuclear you weapon. You say Iran is closer to a nuclear weapon. In 1993, I believe, mm -hmm. when you were in front of Congress mm -hmm. as a CIA director, you said that they were eight to ten years away from a nuclear weapon. In 2008, you said they would have nuclear weapons very soon. Last year, you said they'd have them within a few months. Some would say you sound like the boy who cried wolf. Well, I think that's wrong. I think you... It's wrong? Do they I have think, nuclear I, weapons? No, no, I think it's wrong to call me a boy who cried wolf. Well, you said in 1993 I, I they would have nuclear weapons within eight to ten years. I think you're going to find that Iran probably, years. and I'd say it's greater than a 50-50. In 1993, you said they were eight to ten years away from having nuclear weapons. You were wrong, were you not? Well, I, I want to see my quote. I, uh, I, I, can, I can read to you. Right. I brought it with me just right, in case. Ahead. You said, Iran is pursuing the acquisition of nuclear weapons. Yes. Iran probably will take at least eight to ten years to produce its own I nuclear said at weapons. Least. Yeah, I think that's fine. At least eight to ten years. Yeah. Twenty-two years later, they don't have nuclear weapons. I don't know that you're right. Do you, do you think I, they have nuclear weapons right now? It is possible that Iran, all it lacks is having assembled one. And the assembling is is negligible and difficult. I mean, it completely wrong. contradicts all the intelligence that is out there. It completely contradicts everything the IEA has said. I it think completely you're quite wrong. Uh, well, you're quite wrong. Well, uh, with, with respect, took, Ambassador, it, we'll see. You're the one took, who's been wrong consistently took, for 25 years. It, you were wrong about Iraq. It destabilized the region. It had turned it into a complete mess. And I, frankly, I think you're lucky that people are still not, listening to you. The United States did not turn the region into a mess. The reason, region is especially a mess now because of the imperial designs of Iran. They're imperial in Yemen, they're imperial in Syria, they're imperial uh, in Iraq. Uh, and one of the reasons for the rise of ISIS is because so many people in the Middle East are so worried about Iranian imperialism. Deal, I mean, deal with this specific point about uh, the Iranian involvement in other conflicts, because if the Americans and the Iranians are to work together, even against ISIL, how do you deal with the fact that in every other theater of the Middle East, as James Woolsey points out, from Syria to Israel, Palestine to Yemen, America and Iran are on very different sides? They are, and, and one of the drivers of instability in the region for the last 25 years has been that the Iranians and the United States have constantly been on opposite side on almost every theater in the region. If the United States and Iran, at a minimum, disentangle themselves and don't use the various theaters in the Middle East to fight each other, to pursue their rivalry with each other, that in and of itself can help stabilize the region. The big That's mistake important. the United States made was not supporting directly, Obama made, not supporting directly the Iranian people back in 09 and 010 when the Iranian government was massacring them in the streets because they wanted a fair and real election. This is the challenge of, of speaking highly of the Iranian people and then never listening to them. The Green Movement ultimately won because it's thanks to the Green Movement that Hassan Rouhani got elected. They're the ones who, despite oh, all the odds... Just, but hold, so on, hold, on, hold on, Twitter. Yeah. Hold on, Twitter. The current Iranian government, of which Pre Rouhani is the president, has the leaders of the Green Movement under house arrest. Of course it does. The right now, Iran they're under hold house on, arrest. Hold on. See, what you're saying Listen is to what I said. nonsense. It's the Iranian nonsense. Green Movement decided to come out and vote, and it's thanks to their vote that Rouhani got elected. Are they completely content with how things have developed? Certainly not when it comes to the imprisonment of Musavi and Karoubi, but 78% of them are delighted that the Rouhani government managed to resolve the nuclear issue together with President Obama. Let me ask you this, James Woolsey. You talk about rhetoric and taking it seriously. Mm -hmm. 
doesn't, isn't that a two-way street? If, you, if you're an American, you have every right to be worried about an Iranian leader who's saying death to America, of course. But if you're an Iranian and you hear John McCain, who was running for president of the United States, saying, singing, bomb, 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 bomb Iran, should you not be worried about that? Nah, he, John doesn't mean that. He, he, John uh, doesn't mean that, <laughs> but I don't know how does. We get to pick and choose I mean, which, which, which belligerent rhetoric we get to. Well, actually, you know, I believe he's a friend time, of yours, John McCain. Time. Oh, he is, I worked for him. So do you I support the, do you, did you, would you sing along in the chorus uh, of Bomb, Bomb, Bomb? Around? Probably uh, only the chorus. I don't know that I'd sing the verses. Okay, so do you see the double standards here? No, this is John, I mean, John was kidding. Given what's happened in Syria, Many more people are anti-Iran or anti-Iranian government than they were five or 10 or 15 years ago. Regardless of whether they have nuclear weapons, they are propping up a dictator who is killing hundreds of thousands of people, tens of thousands of people, uh, innocent civilians with chemical weapons even. How do you get past that if you want you to have a You don't get past that. That's absolutely uh, disastrous that the Iranians are doing so. You're quite correct. The Iranian standing on the Arab street has never been lower than this, even during the time of the Iraq-Iran war. And I think there's a lot of people in Iran who also really abhor the policy that the Iranian government pursued. So if you're that unpopular that. in your own neighborhood, but hold something up, that I think hold is hold right. But, but, here's but the if thing. you're that unpopular in your own neighborhood, how do you get uh, respect or new relations in the international arena? Well, because the rest of the neighborhood is equally disastrous. One of the problems with the American conversation about, oh, the spread of terrorism in the region is that there's not a word said about Saudi Arabia. The main problems of terror and jihadism is coming out of Saudi Arabia. Arabia, not of Iran. But that you don't hear in Washington that often. I didn't hear the ambassador mention Saudi Arabia once. Five years, ten years from now, what does the relationship between the United States and Iran look like? It depends on how we play our cards right your now. Your prediction? I think that if we pursue a policy of trying to engage the Iranians as well as others, everyone has to be at the table, and we try to resolve these issues, we are having better chances of stabilizing Syria, ending the bloodshed there, getting a different government there, and then we have by just continuing to repeat the problem, do name calling, and not engage all of the different players. You're not gonna have peace without having the players in the region buy into that piece. James Woolsey, your picture, last word to you, what does, a, what does Iran-America relations look like? What do they look it like in 10 years? It depends entirely on whether the Iranian people have been able to cast off this horrible totalitarian government. I think it's going to be a very hard pull for them because the government is ruthless and repressing the people as it was back in 09 and 010. Uh, it uh, is uh, imperially minded and is not trying to dominate much of the Middle East. And I think that as long as that continues, particularly through its terrorism, uh, I think that uh, the chance of, of, of conciliation and cooperation is close to nil. Thank you, gentlemen. We've run out of time there. Thanks for joining me uh, in the arena. That's our show. But before we go... A clock. That's all it was. But for 14-year-old Ahmed Mohammed from a town in Texas, that simple homemade invention got him arrested when he took it to school. They thought a kid called Ahmed had a hoax bomb. But he's had a massive outpouring of public support since, with President Obama inviting him to the White House. Earlier, I spoke to Ahmed and began by asking him what it's like to be the country's most talked about teenager. It's really amazing how quick stuff can go down. And do you think that was because of what happened on Twitter and Facebook? Everyone tweeting, I stand with Ahmed. What, was that the cause of all your uh, support? Yes, it was all thanks to my internet family. Ahmed, let me ask you about what happened to you this week. Um, why do you think your teachers who knew you, you were this great student, why do you think they reacted the way they did when they saw this clock that you had made at home? Why did they assume it was a hoax bomb? Because I'm Muslim. Because you're Muslim? Why do you think that? Um, and uh, there's a lot of stereotypes for people who are foreigners and they have Muslim names, well, not specifically Muslim names, but names mainly in Islam. So you don't think that would have happened to one of your classmates had they brought a clock into school? No, um, this wouldn't happen to any of my classmates. You sure of that? Yes. Do you think the school or the police should apologize to you, say sorry for what that happened? Yes, they, they should apologize, but there is no apology at the moment. You're now an inspiration to a lot of other kids, I'm sure, who've seen that you went through something so horrible, but something so amazing came out of it. You've had invitations from NASA and Google and Facebook. Even President Obama has invited you to the White House. So the end result has been pretty amazing. Yes, um, thank you, Obama. Thank you, Mark Zuckerberg, all my fans, all my 
my internet families, my fam, and assalamu alaikum to all my people in the in the Arab world and anywhere around the world. Do you think what you went through and, and the positive reaction and all the support you've had from people across the country, across the world, do you think that'll stop this from happening hopefully in other schools to other kids? I, I pray. This isn't my first invention and it won't be my last invention. Just because one person did something to me doesn't mean they can change who I am. And don't let them change you. You can watch the rest of my interview with Ahmed on the Upfront website. That's our show. We'll be back next week.